and to make sure that uh, the American people overall begin to understand why their common sense is what they should rely on and not on what they're told by the national media, the state-run media, so to speak. Now, uh, I, I think the whole trend really began with the fall of uh, the Soviet Union uh, because the great champion of, of the opponents of liberty, uh, namely communism, uh, had to find some other place to go, and they basically went into the environmental movement. And now, that's not to say there aren't some major and significant environmental issues, particularly at the local level, uh, but uh, it, they converted uh, environmental activism, activism to a political uh, movement, and some would say a religious movement. Yeah, and really what these are is parasites. I mean, they want to organize our lives. They want to run our lives. I'll never forget back in the mid-'90s, they were stealing farmers' and ranchers' land in and around Austin, in the name of environmentalism, they later built on it and sold it to themselves. They were just bank robbers, criminals. And I remember being in a meeting with these city council advisors, and, they, and, I, and I said, this isn't freedom. And they said, everything's a planned economy. You know, somebody's got to do it. I mean, they, they really think it's their job to run our lives. How do we beat the forces of tyranny? Well, you have to do it by education and by uh, reminding the American people uh, that their basic common sense instincts are correct, uh, their own private property is is important. Their incomes are important, and they should not uh, transfer that to the government. Well, it's, uh, their first chance to express themselves uh, uh, politically is coming up in the next congressional election. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 you all and all of us have to try to mobilize the most massive uh, turnout of people who reject this current approach. Uh, and begin to turn it around and get back to what uh, uh, would be the basic fundamental principles of constitutional government uh, that we uh, we were founded upon. Well, I noticed you mentioned the last few administrations uh, you know, being a problem, and, and, and so I'm glad you're recognizing, obviously, that both parties are run by these special interests. Why would big wealthy interests want to collectivize things? Is that because it creates monopolies, allows them to shut down their competition? I mean, it's not just a bunch of hippies and communists running around that are doing this. They've got a lot of a lot of powerful friends. Well, there's no question there's a lot of, um, of uh, money influence in this process. Uh, and, uh, and, that, and, and I don't know what's motivating people who have... Uh, basically been dependent on a free enterprise system to get where they are today. Uh, now, clearly, small business, medium-sized business, the kind of business that I'm involved in in various ways, uh, they do not operate that way. Uh, but there are, uh, particularly in the media and entertainment world, major corporations who have, uh, have bought into and believe that their future is going to be... Uh, uh, tied to their their economic future, tied to this approach uh, to uh, attacking liberty and to uh, building a a more socialistic approach to uh, providing for the needs of the American people. Uh, that uh, that is a very dangerous trend. There's no question about it. Well, it's made it even worse by by the way uh, we've allowed the Congress not only to uh, become permanent fixtures. Uh, very few congressmen and senators, if they run for re-election, ever get uh, defeated. Uh, and that's, that's in large part because the federal election law have been, uh, have been, uh, biased towards the incumbent. Yeah. And, and now we've even seen, and uh, George Bush really made a major tactical error, uh, but we've seen that, uh, the uh, federal election law now permits an attack on political speech uh, before each election, uh, by restricting uh, independent advertising. Well, Dr. Schmidt, uh, Apollo uh, astronaut, Apollo 18 astronaut, I, I, I'm sure you've probably seen the Cyberbullying Act, and even got local newscasts pushing it now, the press is that bad, the Hate Crimes Act, it now says if your speech causes someone to do something violent, even if you're not calling for violence, they're going to come arrest you. And, and, and now the FBI is fluttering around saying if somebody makes a comment on a message board that's yours, 
we may come after you for what they said. I mean, this is this is really happening to people I know. Well, that that's why it, you've got we've got to make a change of direction in the United States government, a drastic change. Uh, and uh, and as I say, uh, the next election is the is the key turning point. The next two elections are particularly key. If uh, if the powers that are currently in Washington maintain their control uh, through this next election. Uh, in the next two elections, then uh, I'm not sure how you turn it around. Okay. In the 16 minutes or so we have left of you, I want to shift gears now uh, and get into the moon. Return to the moon, and it has that really great other headline here uh, about uh, colonizing. In fact, guys, put that up on screen for the TV viewers. Not I just don't the radio. think you use that word. I think I use settling. Sure, that's why I wanted to put it up on the screen so I could actually... There it is. The Human Settlement of Space, Return to the Moon. Tell us tell us what that headline means for the book. Well, the, uh, the moon is, the, uh, is the, the nearest place in space where human beings can homestead. Uh, the resources are there to once established, uh, settlements are established, the resources are there uh, not only to support those settlements, uh, with the uh, water and oxygen and food and other things that you need, uh, independently of the Earth. Uh, but uh, there is one resource that's there that allows for a, an economy that uh, uh, can, uh, uh, through the export of that resource, to the Earth. And that's a light isotope of helium called helium-3, which is a nearly ideal fuel for fusion power generation. And so uh, that's what the book is all about. It tries to put together in a very, very broad way uh, the beginnings of a plan for the private sector uh, to initiate the settlement of the moon and to provide the Earth with a major new energy resource. Amazing. Uh, now, just because your bio is so lengthy, in a nutshell, tell us about your career as a triple a astronaut you know lunar astronaut tell us about that tell us about the missions just in a nutshell and then i've got some questions well my career started as uh, uh, a geologist uh, the son of a geologist actually uh, in uh, southern new mexico caltech trained and then the harvard phd i did a lot of field work in norway and alaska and uh, when NASA and the National Academy of Sciences asked for volunteers for the uh, first selection of scientists, astronauts, uh, I thought about 10 seconds and raised my hand, and I uh, figuring that if I didn't, I'd probably regret it, and I would have, obviously. Uh, and that, uh, But while at Harvard, I uh, became increasingly uh, concerned about the direction that Harvard-trained uh, public, so-called public servants were taking us, and figured that uh, if I was uh, that concerned that sometime in my life I better think about getting into politics. That opportunity came after my astronaut career uh, had uh, essentially been completed, and I was elected to the United States Senate. Spent uh, six years there learning a great deal about uh, how sausage is made, <laughs> more than uh, most people would like to know, I think. <laughs> And, uh, and and then uh, uh, in the middle of the depression of uh, the recession of uh, 1982, uh, I uh, lost my seat uh, here in New Mexico and uh, and went into uh, uh, an accelerated learning experience in the private sector and free enterprise uh, and business related activities. Well, that's awesome. And again, the book is Return to the Moon, available everywhere. Uh, Harrison Schmidt is our guest. Uh, how many moon missions were you involved in in total? Well, I was involved in essentially all the moon missions, uh, uh, but I only flew on Apollo 17, uh, the last of the Apollo series. I, uh, my involvement in other uh, missions was, was uh, multifaceted. I, I was primarily responsible for setting up the uh, lunar science and field geological science training program for the uh, pilot astronauts. I uh, was responsible for overseeing for the astronaut office the development of various scientific experiments, the development mm -hmm. and storage of the descent stage of the uh, lunar module. And you also, as uh, said, discovered a lot of the most important rocks. 
uh, w- w- which mission put that laser up that the University of Texas uh, contacts every uh, few days? What was actually deployed on the moon uh, three different times, one, the first one by Apollo 11, as a matter of fact, 40 years ago, uh, was a, uh, a reflector. And uh, the uh, various uh, uh, observatories now shoot that those reflectors, the three of them that were finally deployed, with laser beams and have been able to uh, very, very precisely determine uh, the distance from the Earth to the moon as well as the motions of the continent.